Hello, my name is John Jacobson, and I'll be providing a lecture as an introduction to musculoskeletal ultrasound. A few disclosures. I'm a consultant for Bioclinica. I'm on an advisory board for GE and Phillips. Book royalty is from Elsevier. I also have to disclose that I'm an unpaid consultant for both regular and sugar-free Red Bull products. For this lecture, I'll be focusing on tendon evaluation as this is the most common application for musculoskeletal ultrasound. I'll be focusing on the rotator cuff in the shoulder, the common extensor tendon in the elbow, the iliosos complex in the hip, the patellar tendon in the knee, and finally the Achilles and perineal tendons at the ankle. So what do normal tissues look like at ultrasound? Well, tendon has a hyperechoic or bright echotexture that appears fibrillar as shown here. In contrast, muscle is relatively hypoechoic, as shown here in the deltoid, although we see intervening echogenic fiber adipose layers. The bone cortex is hyperechoic with shadowing, as shown also here. Note the MR correlation showing the field of interest that we'll be seeing with ultrasound on this example. One must be aware of an artifact called anisotropy. This occurs when the sound beam is not perpendicular to a tendon or other structure such as ligament or muscle. When the tendon is perpendicular to the sound beam, it appears hyperechoic and fibrillar or normal in appearance. However, if the sound beam hits this tendon obliquely, what will happen is the sound beam will ricochet into a different direction. And therefore, the ultrasound machine sending this ultrasound pulse does not receive any information back as it echoes scattered in different directions. So it interprets this area as without any echo, therefore this appears artifactually hypoechoic. Now the problem is tendinosis appears hypoechoic as well. So this is where the operator dependence occurs in ultrasound because we have to move the transducer continually so that when we have an area that is not perpendicular to the sound beam, we have to redirect the ultrasound beam by moving the probe, hoping that this artifactual area will improve. Here again showing normal hyperechoic fibrillar tendon. So looking at tendon abnormalities, I tend to put this into three categories. Tendinosis, partial thickness tear, and full thickness tear. For tendinosis, the tendon will be abnormally hypoechoic, usually increased in thickness with possible hyperemia. Partial thickness tears, typically coexisting with tendinosis, will have the appearance of tendinosis with the added feature of an anechoic cleft or focus. A full thickness tendon tear is characterized by discontinuity, where dynamic imaging is helpful to show tendon retraction, indicating a full thickness tear. Of note, tendinitis is not in the vocabulary here because it's been shown in every tendon in the body. After about day seven to 10 after an injury, the true inflammatory phase is gone. So by the time they come to imaging, there is no inflammation present. If there is hyperemia, this has been shown to represent neovascularity and not inflammation. First, the rotator cuff. The normal anatomy, we can see the supraspinatus superiorly, the subscapularis anteriorly, the infraspinatus and teres minor posteriorly. So how well does ultrasound perform when looking for rotator cuff tears? Well, this is a meta-analysis of 65 articles showing that, first of all, with full thickness tears, MR arthrography, MRI, and ultrasound are fairly equal in sensitivity, 92 to 95%, although MR arthrography is more specific. With partial thickness tears, MR arthrography is most sensitive at 86% and most specific, followed by ultrasound and MRI at 64%. Now, I'm not here to say that ultrasound outperforms MRI, but the point here is both ultrasound and MRI can perform equal in sensitivity and specificity when looking at rotator cuff tears. Note that we perform less well when looking at partial thickness tears compared to full thickness tears. So we, we must be aware of the normal appearance of the tendon and specifically the borders of the normal supraspinatus tendon. We have three different surfaces. We have the articular surface, the bursal surface, and the greater tuberosity surface. 
also shown here on MRI. Here's a closer view of the surfaces of the distal supraspinatus tendon. The greater tuberosity surface has designated the footprint of the tendon where it attaches onto the bone. This term is used at any tendon or ligament attachment onto bone where the surface of the bone is called its respective footprint. Why this is important is that when you identify an abnormality, we need to understand which surface of the tendon it connects to. For example, if it only touches the articular surface and does not extend to the bursal surface, this is a partial articular sided tear, also called a rim rent tear or a posta lesion. If the abnormality involves the bursal surface but doesn't, attach, doesn't connect to the articular surface, this is a partial thickness bursal sided tear. Note that in both of these examples, the abnormality does in fact touch the greater tuberosity surface, but because it does not connect the articular to bursal surface as shown here, we have excluded a full thickness tear. The imagenia left is an example where we have an abnormality which is buried with inside the tendon called an intrasubstance or interstitial tear. Note that this indeed does touch the bone very commonly but because it doesn't touch either of the other two surfaces, this would not be seen at arthroscopy or bursoscopy. Also note the bone irregularity, which I'm showing in these examples, a very important indirect sign of a rotator cuff tear. To re-emphasize this point, it's been shown that if you see cortical irregularity at the supraspinatus footprint on a radiograph, 75% of those patients will have a rotator cuff tear. If that bone is smooth, 96% will have a normal rotator cuff. Note that we see this bone irregularity very clearly on ultrasound. Here the bone is smooth, and there it's markedly irregular at the footprint of the supraspinatus. So here's an example of an articular sided partial thickness tear of the supraspinatus. We have a well-defined defect. It's touching the hypocoachylian cartilage over the humeral head. It's not touching the bursal surface, therefore excluding a full thickness tear. Note that the MRI is essentially a mirror image of the ultrasound. Normal tendon on the ultrasound is bright. On MRI, the normal tendon is dark. The abnormality or tear is dark on the ultrasound. It's bright on the MRI. Note that the bone cortex is bright on the ultrasound, where it is dark on the MRI. So it's really the same anatomy although higher resolution with the ultrasound. So if you understand the anatomy and the bone landmarks by MR, it's the same thing we see on ultrasound. Here in contrast is a partial thickness bursal sided tear of the supraspinatus. Now if you look at the more superficial fibers of the supraspinatus, it should be convex superior, but instead there's a triangular defect here touching the bursal surface extending to the greater tuberosity. Also shown here on the MRI, which is fluid signal. Now the problem that occurs with these bursal sided tears is that the defect tends to fill with more echogenic bursal thickening or synovitis as shown here, which also shows this intermediate signal on the MRI. Now here's an example of a full thickness tear, and this one's a little bit easier because the defect is filled with anechoic fluid, which clearly outlines the end of the tendon stump that's been torn or evolved from the greater tuberosity. Also note another indirect sign of a rotator cuff tear by ultrasound, the cartilage interface sign. If you have fluid laying on top of the normal hypocoachylian cartilage, the interface between that cartilage and fluid will be even brighter than normal. And that tells you that something indeed is extending to the articular surface. Here in short axis, we can see the full width of the tear. Again, the cartilage interface sign and here looking more distal over the greater tuberosity facets, the width of the rotator cuff tear. And as the tear gets larger in this next example, we see further retraction of the tendon, where it should be attached here. There's the hyaline cartilage, the fluid filled defect. Note the flattening as the deltoid is laying down into the torn tendon gap. Yet another indirect sign of a rotator cuff tear, which is volume loss of where we expect to see the rotator cuff. And on the MRI, the same example and the same imaging findings. Here in short axis of that same patient, 
we see that this is not just a full thickness tear, but a full width or complete tear of the supraspinatus where the entire tendon is torn from anterior to posterior, again also shown on the MRI. Moving on to the elbow, we're going to look at tennis elbow, or the lateral aspect. First, the anatomy. We can see over the radial head and attaching to the lateral epicondyle, we have two structures. The radiolateral ligament is the deeper structure and the common extensor tendon laying directly over that. So it's important to understand this anatomy when looking with ultrasound and for that matter with MRI. Now ligament appears echogenic and fibular somewhat like tendon. So in the normal situation, we know that the radiolateral ligament underneath the common extensor tendon, they quite blend in together. It can be difficult to separate these two structures. So to help us with this, this is from a study where we had a surgeon resect the common extensor tendon from a cadaver. With the cadaver in a water bath, we can see what's left behind the radiolateral ligament. Here are the annular ligament and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. But here's the footprint of the common extensor tendon. So we know that based on the slope of the lateral epicondyle, this outer approximately 50% distance is the attachment of the common extensor tendon. So what are we looking for with ultrasound? Well, like with any tendon, we're looking for hypoechoic thickening, which would indicate tendinosis. You could see anechoic clefts or interstitial tearing. You uncommonly could see a full thickness tear, but again, there are no inflammatory cells, cells here. This is tendinosis and not tendinitis. So actually epicondylitis, the term is a misnomer for several reasons. First of all, it's not inflamed. The second thing is it's not an epicondyle problem. It's a tendon problem that just happens to occur at the epicondyle. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if you have tendinosis of your supraspinatus, we don't call it greater tuberosityitis, so why would we use the term epicondylitis here? Well, it's an older term. Basically approach this like any other tendon problem with ultrasound or MRI. So here looking at this case, we see the hypocoic thickening, loss of the fibrillar ec echo texture, indicating tendinosis of the common extensor tendon. Note the underlying normal appearing radiolateral ligament going to the annular ligament. Also note the radial head, which is a key bone landmark for seeing our bone anatomy for orientation. Note the hyperemia on color and power Doppler imaging. Again, this is not inflammation. This is neovascularity, which correlates with patient symptoms. Now, when you start to see a more anechoic area in this companion case, with more fluid signal on MRI, that tells us there is coexisting interstitial tearing in the setting of tendinosis of the common extensor tendon. Moving on to the iliosoas complex, if we look at the short axis image up here, this corresponds to the illustration labeled A. This tendon here, which we have called the ilios tendon, iliosoas tendon, is actually the psoas major tendon because the iliacus portion of the iliosoas hasn't even formed yet. Right over here is the muscle belly of the psoas major shown in red on this image. And then here is the iliacus muscle. We have the lateral part, which is purple on the illustration, and the medial part, which is orange. So why is this important? Well, when we're looking for snapping hip syndrome, what will happen is the medial part of the iliacus will abnormally get entrapped underneath the psoas major tendon. And when that muscle moves out of the way, the tendon will snap and hit the ilium and the superior pubic ramus, creating the snap. So here in this illustration taken from the literature, you see the partial entrapment of the medial part of the iliacus between the psoas major tendon and the adjacent bone. So here's a video clip showing snapping hip syndrome of the iliopsoas. Laterals on the left, medial on the right. Here's the ilium. This is going to be the lateral part of the iliacus, the medial part. This is the psoas major muscle. And this is the psoas major tendon, here shown with anisotropy. So when we start the video clip, keep an eye on the psoas major tendon. The tendon's right there. And you can see the tendon moves away from the bone and then snaps down to the bone. As it moves away from the bone, you see the iliacus medial fibers going in a 
counterclockwise fashion underneath that psoas major tendon becoming temporarily entrapped. And then as it's released, it moves out of the way, the tendon snaps down to the bone. So the anatomy of the iliopsoas complex is key for understanding snapping hip related to iliopsoas. Moving on to the patellar tendon, looking at what's called jumper's knee, it's tendinosis and possible interstitial tearing of the patellar tendon, usually proximally, typically central and deep involving the patellar tendon. Neovascularity is often present, again representing hyperemia and not inflammation, and this corresponds to patient symptoms. So here's the normal patellar tendon, fibular and echogenic, and here we see it hypoechoic and thickened in hyperemia present, again consistent with tendinosis. Note here the bone anatomy, there's the patella over here, and then the anatomy of the patellar tendon. So we understand the anatomy based on these bone landmarks. Here's a companion case, actually two of them, showing full thickness tears of the patellar tendon. Here we see a defect at the proximal part, and here's a defect of the distal tendon. This complete discontinuity with retraction indicates full thickness tear. Moving on to the Achilles tendon, tendon problems tend to occur in two different locations. Most commonly, two to six centimeters proximal to its insertion, where you may see tendinosis, partial and full thickness tears, or less commonly at the calcaneal attachment. Again, tendinosis and tears may be seen. Something called Hagelin syndrome, where you have a combination of tendinosis, bursal distension, and a pronounced posterior calcaneal tuberosity causing a focused abnormality at the distal Achilles. So tendinosis of the Achilles looks like tendinosis everywhere. The tendon is thickened, it's hypoechoic. No compared to the proximal aspect, how thickened it is. Hyperemia, not inflammation, this is not tendinitis. This neovascularity also relates to patient symptoms. When you start to see more anechoic clefts or hypoechoic well-defined clefts within the abnormal tendon, now you can say there's interstitial tearing superimposed on a background of tendinosis. And then a full thickness tear is shown here. There's the defect. The complete discontinuity with retraction here indicates full thickness tear, also shown on the MRI. Now what is very helpful is dynamic imaging in this scenario. With the patient laying on, the, laying on their stomach, if you dorsiflex and plantar flex the foot, you'll bring out retraction of one tendon stump compared to the other tapered end. And if you can bring out this retraction, you know it's a full thickness tear. Incidentally, at the medial aspect, this intact tendon here is the plantaris that should not be misinterpreted as intact or spared Achilles tendon fibers. Here's the FHL, or flexor alsus longus. The echogenic triangle here is Kager's fat pad. The perineal tendons can be also evaluated with ultrasound. Here's an example of a split tear where the longus is located here. The brevis has a piece here and a piece there as the longus insinuates into the torn split of the brevis. Here as we move the transducer proximal and distal, you can appreciate the horseshoe-shaped horseshoe appearance of the peroneus brevis with the longus then insinuating into a cleft separating the tendon into two separate pieces. Another advantage of ultrasound is the dynamic imaging where we can put the ankle through a range of motions to bring out abnormal movement of the tendon, either subluxation if it's partially moving out of its normal location or dislocation if it's completely removed from its normal location. And when you have this abnormal movement, this implies abnormal retinoculum and can predispose to tendon tears. So as, as you can see, the superior perineal retinoculum connects basically to the fibula, keeping these tendons posterior to the fibula. If the retinoculum is stripped or if it's torn, this can allow the tendons to move from their normal location. Here's an example where this is posterior this is anterior, cross-section of the tendons. They should be located back here, but they're actually dislocating out this way. The retinaculum is right here. That should be attached to the fibula, but it's no longer attached. And while we move uh, the ankle in the various motion, 
we can see the tendon snapping over the edge of the fibula. Note the anechoic fluid, the thickened tissue, therefore representing tenosynovitis. Now this must be differentiated from intrasheath subluxation, where the tendons, the perineal tendons may snap on themselves, but not actually displaced because the retinaculum is intact. This is very common occurrence when you have a posterior convex fibula. Normally the fibula should be somewhat concave, keeping these tendons in their location. But in this scenario, we can see a posterior convex appearance. Therefore, the tendons are pushed lateral and anterior. And here with movement of the ankle, we have abrupt snapping of the tendons uh, upon each other. Note the thin retinaculum is normal here as it's attached to the fibula. So take home points on this review of tendon ultrasound. So first of all, with any musculoskeletal ultrasound examination, bone landmarks are key. This is important for orientation, but also when you're looking at tendons, this tells us where the tendons are located. And also, many chronic tendon problems occur at their footprints or attachments, so the bone landmarks are key. We must avoid anisotropy, especially when looking at tendon. When we're looking at tendons, the sound beam must be perpendicular to the tendon fibers. And we continually move the transducer around to redirect the sound beam. The hallmark finding of tendinosis, hypocalc thickening, loss of the normal fibular echotexture with possible increased thickness. If you do see hyperemia, it's not inflammation, it's neovascularity. When you start to see a distinct cleft or defect, either hypoechoic or anechoic, then you're moving into the category of tendon tear. And when you're differentiating partial from full thickness tear, if you see retraction, that would actually favor the latter. And finally, specifically the rotator cuff, ultrasound has been shown to be relative similar accuracy to MRI, so that with the proper training and proper experience, you're able to perform equal when using ultrasound when compared to MRI. And then finally, dynamic evaluation. There are several examples I showed in this talk where movement of a joint or an extremity can bring out pathology that would not normally be seen with static imaging, such as MRI. For example, the iliopsoas snapping, the perineal tendon snapping, and also bringing out tendon retraction in the setting of a full thickness tear. Thank you very much for your attention.